Welcome everyone to AURI Connect's Webinar Wednesday, part of AURI Connect's monthly online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. I'm Dan Scogan, the AURI Director of Government and Industry Relations, and your host on Webinar Wednesday. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization oh. Research Institute of Minnesota with sponsorship from Bremer Bank. This program aims to actively engage all participants in the food and egg industry to improve competitiveness of producers, businesses, and entrepreneurs through ongoing purposeful connection of resources and partners along the value chain and increased knowledge of opportunities, technologies, and trends. Remember, this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Remember that you will be muted during our presentations, but you can send us your questions through the Q&A portal on your screen. Today's webinar, Helping Farmers Create New Value-Added Products Through AURI's USDA Agricultural Innovation Center Program Grant Award. You're going to hear from Director Colleen Landcamer. Colleen was appointed by President Obama to serve as USDA Rural Development State Director for Minnesota back in 2009. She was reappointed by President Biden in February of last year, and once again serves as the USDA State Director of Rural Development. She has attended the Army War College, has been a Humphrey Institute Policy Fellow, a Columbia University Rural Policy Fellow, graduate of the Senior Executive Program in State and Local Government at Harvard University, and a graduate of the 2005 New York University Leadership Program. You'll also hear from Shannon Schlecht, Executive Director of AURI. Shannon is responsible for the overall strategic and operational oversight of the AURI staff, its programs, and the execution of its mission. AURI provides technical services to businesses, conducts applied research initiatives, and convenes networking events to create value-added economic opportunities for the food and agriculture sector. Also joining our conversation today will be Richard Magnuson. Richard is the managing partner of Magnuson Farms. He operates an 11,000 acre farm with his nephews in Roseau County, Minnesota. And together they produce both spring and winter wheat, perennial ryegrass, soybeans, sunflowers, flax, canola, rye, oats, and forage grass for seed production. In addition to these crops, the three of them also focus on seed production for both public and private genetics. They were also one of the initial growers of Kernza, a perennial intermediate wheat grass as part of the University of Minnesota's Forever Green Initiative. And Jennifer Wagner Lahr will be joining us during the question and answer portion of the program. As Senior Director of Business Development and Commercialization, Jennifer Wagner Lahr oversees projects in partnership with AURI staff members, commodity groups, state and federal agencies, and other collaborators and stakeholders that fulfill the AURI mission and advance the development of value-added agricultural products within Minnesota. But to get that conversation started today, I want to welcome State Director Landcammer to Webinar Wednesday. I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak to you today. As Dan said, my uh, name is Colleen Landcammer. I'm the State Director for USDA Rural Development in Minnesota. For those who may be unfamiliar, Rural Development is an agency under the Department of Agriculture that brings programs and funding to improve and grow rural America. USDA Rural Development has over 70 programs across three areas of concentration, Rural Business and Cooperative Service, the Rural Housing Service, and the Rural Utility Service. We rely on our partnerships with organizations like AURI now more than ever for leveraging resources and information to better ensure we continue to meet the unique needs of each rural community across Minnesota. Through our many partnerships, USDA has invested more than $1.5 billion in Minnesota's rural economy, infrastructure, economic development, and housing opportunities over the past two years alone. One of these partnerships is being recognized today, and that's AURI. In 2022, AUR, AURI received a $500,000 grant through USDA to operate an Ag Innovation Center that will provide technical assistance to ag producers for the development 
and marketing of value-added ag products. This program is meant to help widen the scope of assistance in the ag field from businesses and market development to organizing financials to product development and analysis. AURI and other recipients of funding through this program are providing an essential service to ag producers in rural areas looking to expand and bring value-added products to the market. As you all know, rural communities are the backbone of our nation and have a broad back impact on our economy. They feed and fuel America, providing our nation's agricultural and energy resources, the fiber and goods for manufacturing, and are home to more than 35% of our nation's military members, despite comprising only 20% of the population. The Biden-Harris administration believes in the growth of innovative ag production and local businesses owned and shared by people who can best serve their own unique community's needs, fill the gaps and build opportunities. Under the leadership of President Biden and Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, USDA is prioritizing equity, access to new opportunities, affordable financing, strong and modern infrastructure, and good paying jobs, climate impacts, reducing, reducing climate pollution, and increasing energy independence through climate smart infrastructure. Building back a better rural America, assisting rural communities with economic development, economic recovery. The Ag Innovation Center program implements all of these priorities, and that is why AURI was chosen. Some of the other investment opportunities that USDA has made available for our ag producers include the Fertilizer Production Expansion Program. It's USDA's latest addition to a government-wide effort to promote competition in agricultural markets. $500 million in grants were made available to help U.S. farmers increase or expand manufacturing and processing of fertilizer and nutrient alternatives in the United States. Funding was distributed through the Commodity Credit Corporation. The goal of this program is to bring about American-made fertilizer production to spur competition and combat future price hikes. The application period for this program closed in December, but stay tuned for potential funding in uh, 2023. The Meat and Poultry Processing Expansion Grant Program is to help eligible processors expand their capacity, be on the lookout for potential funding cycles to be added. The Food Supply Chain Guaranteed Loan Program was part of USDA's Build Back Better initiative and was created to help critical supply chains in our food system. We're guaranteeing up to $40 million for qualified lenders to finance food systems for startups or expansion activities in the middle of the food supply system. Independently owned and available infrastructure such as cold storage, refrigerated trucks, and processing facilities are in short supply, but essential to creating a more resilient food system. The meat and poultry processing intermediary relending program also la launched this year to close the food processing gap even further. Fiscal year 2022 funding recipients were recently announced, and we are so excited for the opportunities that partnering with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Rural Finance Authority, the offerings that can come from there. MDA is establishing the Meat and Poultry Revolving Loan Fund that will, with help from their $15 million grant from USDA to help Minnesota's meat processors increase capacity. MDA was one of eight recipients in seven states to receive funding this far, more to come. USDA, of course, 
continues to provide funding for ag producers and rural small businesses through longstanding programs such as the Value Added Producer Grant, small socially disadvantaged groups, where we've partnered with local minority groups like the Latino Economic Development Authority and the Hmong American Farmers Association to help underserved populations with jump starting or expanding egg production. So be on the lookout for fiscal year 2023 application windows. For more information on our programs, please visit our website at www.rd.usda.gov slash MN. On our website, you can subscribe to our Gov delivery notifications and to also to receive our newsletter, any stakeholder announcements and opportunities for program and loans and grants. Um, I wanna thank you for having me today. I thank you for your support and we look forward to hearing from you and we are so proud to partner with AURI, thank you. And now I'm gonna send it over to Shannon. Fantastic, thank you Colleen for kicking us off today. And uh, it's a pleasure to work with you on this program and to uh, just thank you for all that you're doing to advance rural development opportunities uh, across the state. So thank you for your, your service and the role that you're playing here for agriculture and for the, the, the broader state economy and development that uh, is occurring here. Uh, I'm gonna start off with just a little bit about ARI for those that may be new uh, to, to ARI through this webinar. Uh, so we are a, a nonprofit corporation based in, in Minnesota that really looks at how can we utilize the, the crops that are produced uh, here, the livestock that is raised into new value added opportunities. Uh, and it is um, uh, through a great staff that we have centered around the state in different locations. Uh, we've got roughly 35 individuals today, uh, two laboratories, one in Marshall, one in Wasika, Minnesota, and then offices up in Crookston, Minnesota as well. Uh, and then staff scattered throughout the, uh, the state that are working hand in hand with producers, with entrepreneurs, with small businesses, cooperatives, uh, agribusinesses, but to really look at how can we move some of those value added opportunities forward, uh, help de-risk some of those concepts and uh, get them into the marketplace. Um, I think last year alone, we worked on over 250 projects um, across the state uh, in our two main buckets of either food or bioindustrial work that includes bio-based products, renewable energy, co-product streams, uh, and seeing how we can move some of those ideas forward uh, together uh, through business assistance and, and technical assistance. So it's a, a very exciting to see the innovation that occurs across Minnesota uh, and the role that we can play in, in moving those ideas along. Uh, so I'll maybe just start a little bit with, with partnerships. So ARI has had a, a longstanding partnership with the Minnesota legislature uh, for over 30 years now to look at how can we um, look at these post-harvest opportunities for crops that are grown here and livestock that is raised here. Uh, it's been a, a great way to um, increase sales and market opportunities for uh, producers and, and agricultural businesses. Uh, and it's also been a, a great way to, um, again, create and retain jobs, uh, look at de-risking some of that capital investment into these, these rural communities, uh, again, to uh, create these economic, uh, ec economic opportunities that utilize agricultural feedstocks. Uh, we've had uh, um, new partnerships with the, the federal government, mainly through USDA. Uh, and uh, a lot through rural development, as Colleen mentioned, uh, the Rural Cooperative Development Grant has been a, a longstanding program that ARI has uh, received uh, to move, move ideas forward. Uh, more recently with the Agricultural Marketing Service on some of the, the meat programs that are, are occurring through there as well, uh, to look at how we can assist small and regional meat processors. Uh, and then we're very excited about the Agricultural Innovation Center Demonstration Grant. Uh, this is a, a program I think that will leverage a lot of the work that we're already doing at AURI uh, and uh, enhance um, right, that, that state mandate that we have to increase opportunities uh, and to really work with our, our agricultural community. So um, just a, a little bit of history, AURI actually received an AIC grant um, back in the 2000s. Um, so uh, it's not the first time that we've, we've had one of these, these grants, but uh, there was a, a long break in terms of uh, this program being, being back um, funded again uh, at USDA. So we're very excited that there's uh, funding for AIC again, and uh, very happy to be one of six uh, entities across the country uh, that currently have received funding and are able to move uh, these Agricultural Innovation Center grants forward. Um, so you know, our work uh, really will be with producers 
uh, as Colleen mentioned, this is a very much a producer focused program in terms of looking at how we can work with producers on their value added ideas. Uh, and it uh, is looking at that technical and business assistance, uh, feasibility, uh, the market analysis, uh, and really thinking about what are some of those new opportunities for the crops that we produce, for the livestock that we raise here, uh, and adding value and looking at new market opportunities. Uh, I think the main benefit is that this will be a no cost program to producers uh, based on our relationship with the, the state and then uh, through this federal funding that we'll be able to do that, hopefully reach more producers through this service based approach uh, and help them capitalize on some of those innovative ideas they have uh, with the crops that they're producing and the livestock that they're raising. Uh, in total, um, right, we'll have five big buckets uh, that we'll be uh, exploring and, and being able to enact uh, with this, this new funding from the from USDA. Uh, and uh, the, those big buckets are our business assistance, uh, something that we do today. Uh, this will just enhance a lot of that work that we do in terms of looking at the market opportunities, um, uh, right, the uh, direct services, just having those referrals and those connections that we can make. Uh, to move some of those ideas forward from a business development standpoint, uh, connecting into the right resources as well on some of those business plans. Uh, we've got market development expertise we'll be able to bring in in terms of assistance on marketing plans, looking at branding opportunities, uh, what are ways that we can look at customer identification to help uh, move some of those, those ideas forward, uh, maybe a little bit more easily or, or smoothly uh, when we look at some of the hurdles of moving those uh, ideas into the marketplace from a, um, from a commercialization standpoint. Uh, our process development, uh, something that we've done for, for many years as an organization as well, uh, taking a look at engineering services, um, different ways that we can look at scaling uh, systems development, you know, how do we go from a bench, bench lab to uh, commercial production or to co-manufacturing, uh, what are ideas that we can help uh, explore and de-risk and help overcome some of those hurdles as we move through that process of uh, putting out a product into the marketplace. Uh, and then product development as well, uh, something that we, again, do on a regular basis. Uh, this will be looking at, you know, that ideation process to packaging to, you know, safety regulations, what's needed as we look at our product development and getting it into the marketplace. You know, and that can be from feed, food, fertilizers, um, biomass fuels, uh, just kind of what's needed on that product development to make it uh, feasible in the marketplace and, and uh, help meet the, the regulatory standards that are out there. Uh, and then finally, the, the last area will be value chain coordination. Uh, and this is, um, you know, I, a new area that we've added uh, expertise in recently of looking at, you know, how do we connect all those different, different pieces of the, the value chain uh, from the producer to, you know, CPG to the consumer. Uh, there's a lot of steps, a lot of complexity in there. Uh, and uh, how can we better um, facilitate some of those introductions, some of those connections uh, from distribution to warehousing to, you know, um, trucking and, and all those different elements to, to assist uh, and make sure that, uh, that we can be as successful as possible with some of these different ideas uh, that we're exploring through this new program. So our goals uh, really as an organization uh, are to, you know, drive new markets, expand new markets, uh, help de-risk some of these ide ideas. Uh, that producers um, have through this um, have as they're looking at market opportunities and uh, just looking at you know how do they manage their risk and, and look at at some different opportunities. Uh, really, it will be you know uh, looking at those hurdles, some of those pain points uh, from product development to process development, and then providing that technical uh, assistance to help move move those concepts forward. And at the end of the day, our our goal is to really create disappearance uh, of the crops that we're producing here. So. Right, getting those into the, the marketplace as quickly as we can, uh, or um, you know, helping avoid um, um, some common mistakes that we've seen throughout our 30 year history, uh, making sure that we're not, um, that we're spending money efficiently, uh, right from a, a producer standpoint and from a business standpoint uh, to move those concepts forward. Um, so I would say as a, a call to action from, from our standpoint, uh, as you're, you're listening to this webinar today, uh, if you know of producers that have been exploring value added opportunities, um, um, you know, get in touch with ARI with this new program that we have funding for two years uh, right now to uh, really assist on those value added producer ideas. Uh, the value added producer grant is a, a you know, one program that, that Colleen mentioned. Uh, this will be more of a service based program where we can assist several producers uh, through our services across those five buckets that I, I just mentioned. Um, I'd also add that other agricultural organizations that are, you know, working with producers on their value added opportunities. Uh, we'd love to collaborate and think of synergies 
uh, of how we can um, you know, enhance what each of us are, are doing in terms of those objectives to create new market opportunities. Uh, let's, uh, let's get together. Um, we'll be reaching out to you. Please reach out to us as well uh, in terms of ways that we can uh, um, create some synergies and, and leverage those uh, resources and opportunities to create, to, to create these uh, new products and these new opportunities. Um, I'll add additionally, this grant provides um, funding for us to add a couple of new positions at AURI. Uh, and one is a market analyst position that we're bringing on board that we haven't had at AURI in the past. Uh, so looking at right a little bit more of that market intelligence piece, uh, looking at some of that raw data that you might need to de-risk some decisions, we'll have that expertise on board and being able to assist on some of these new products. We've done it through our business development team, but this will be a much more a focused approach and uh, having an expert that can can really uh, drill down on some of those uh, questions that you have just to um, um, look at those those data points again in that trend analysis or, or what might be good ideas and, and maybe uh, heading off or steering a different direction when we're looking at, at some of those data points. Uh, and then the other is a biomass business development director. Uh, and as we think about the opportunities that we're seeing around renewable natural gas and anaerobic digestion, uh, and nutrient recovery of different biomass feedstocks. Uh, this position will really help uh, dig into some of those areas, um, uh, answer some of those questions that, that may be arising uh, as uh, producers look at those opportunities or are approached by developers that are looking at those opportunities as well. And how do we um, you know, work in, in terms of uh, de-risking some of those, those areas that we're seeing just a lot of uh, interest uh, in uh, at this point in time. Um, so those are, are a, a couple of, of uh, new additions that is great to enhance uh, the work that we'll be doing at ARI through this, uh, through this AIC grant uh, and moving that along. Um, so I'm, I'll just finish um, from, from my standpoint with, um, you know, it's great to have the Undersecretary of Rural Development out um, last summer, as, as um, Director Landcammer mentioned, uh, and we were able to visit uh, Ten Fins Dairy out in, in Monaga, Minnesota. Uh, and just you know, see that innovation that's happening uh, here within rural Minnesota of different ideas. Uh, how do we how do we uh, move those along? What resources are needed? Uh, we talked about some of the technical assistance that ARI had provided uh, in that journey that that they're on as well. Um, so it's great to again showcase uh, some of those efforts. Uh, and I I think of all the producers that we've worked with at ARI over the the 30 year plus history, uh, and just um right just a great great to see that innovation and. Uh, what's happening in ways that we can play a, a small role uh, right in the risk that that many of our um, producers are taking uh, to move their their ideas forward uh, and i'm very excited to have richard magnuson with us here today uh, i think richard is a very innovative uh, individual that's um, uh, done a lot up in northwest minnesota of uh, exploring ideas and um, putting them into action so richard i'm going to turn the floor over to you to um, share a little bit about your story and how you uh, approach innovation and um, uh, share just a, a few more thoughts there. So Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, yeah, it's uh, in the introduction kind of talked about we're a very diverse uh, farming operation. Part of it, we're right on the Canadian border, 60 miles east of the North Dakota border. Uh, there's only about a 120 day growing season up here. Uh, the area historically has always been very diverse, kind of goes back to the original settlers. They, they grew a lot of uh, clovers for seed production, uh, red clover, sweet clover, uh, L-side clover. Uh, and, and again, part of it was mitigating risk from weather and part of it was profitability. And I think that's carried through, to, you know, all the way to today that farmers are always in the area looking of ways to mitigate risk and seek more profitability. So that uh, clover business back in the 1940s and 50s kind of spawned a uh, Kentucky bluegrass for lawn seed business. And consequently, a, a group of uh, seed processing plants uh, grew up around the area. And, and that provided more opportunities uh, going along. So uh, kind of fast forward to 2000, the, the grass seed industry was pretty much reliant on Kentucky bluegrass uh, as the main seed species that we were producing. The university had been developing uh, perennial ryegrass varieties. Now, one of the challenges with growing perennial ryegrass in our area was we always knew we could grow it, but it uh, the seed is the same size as uh, quackgrass, which is a weed contaminant, and there's no way to clean the two apart. So the university was developing a, a non-GMO uh, perennial ryegrass that uh, you could spray quackgrass out of perennial ryegrass. So, so one of our first, or one of our projects uh, that we worked on, <clears throat> the uh, university, when they were getting close to development of that, 
uh, <clears throat> variety of ryegrass at a sure tolerance, it was not going to be a public release. You know, historically, prior to that, all variety of releases from the University of Minnesota had been public releases. It was going to be a private release. And <clears throat> part of it at the time, we, we didn't have an organized group in northern Minnesota to, to go after that uh, licensing agreement with the University of Minnesota. So we formed a, co a cooperative uh, of the growers in the area. They uh, each put a small amount in to get the cooperative start started. Uh, we uh, licensed the, uh, that first original release from the University of Minnesota, and uh, that has gone on to, and, and then hired a marketer to market that variety in the marketplace, uh, worked with low, local processors to clean and condition that seed and to get it ready for marketing. So that has grown to be, uh, we've since licensed uh, five more varieties from the University of Minnesota. You know, over the past 20 years, we've produced about 60 million pounds of seed and the royalties from our seed production have brought back about two and a half million back to the University of Minnesota. So it's been a win-win from all sides. The, it's a high, probably one of the highest income crops in, in the area. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, it spawned, you know, <clears throat> allied industry, the seed processors, more, more work happening in the area. Uh, so that that was one of the you know value added or organized things we did. The other thing about the same time, one of our uh, local seed cleaning companies uh, was owned by the Marvin family, whose main business is uh, manufacturing windows. They've they've been in the seed cleaning business since the you know nineteen uh, twenties <clears throat> or thirties, and uh, the seed plant was basically get, kind of getting in the way of the window factory and they wanted to expand the window factory and we're gonna get out of the seed cleaning business. So they offered uh, the uh, cleaning equipment out of the plant to the growers that were you know, uh, customers of, of them if they would rebuild a plant. So uh, <clears throat> again, formed a group of farmers to uh, uh, you know, investigate the possibility of uh, <clears throat> of a building a new cleaning plant. And, and that happened <clears throat> over the years. Uh, it took a few years to get that completely off the ground and up and running. And, uh, but uh, ARI was involved in helping to, ban, to plan, plan our business plan in both the, you know, the, our case of the RL Grower Cooperative and the uh, Northern Excellence Sea Cleaning Plant. Uh, you know, it was a challenge. It, uh, you know, it's kind of a business the growers were aware of, but weren't familiar with, and uh, we needed to do a lot of investigating on how to proceed forward. That that uh, <clears throat> plant is is continuing today. Uh, you know, still it's still a farmer owned uh, LLC, uh, processing about 25 million pounds of seed a year. And again, it's one of those things. Once you get something going, it it brings in more. So. We, you know, we started with the University of Minnesota varieties, but now we have companies from literally all over the world coming to Northern Minnesota to contract seed production. Uh, some of the biggest names in the industry, Pennington, Scott's, uh, DLF Seeds. So we, uh, it's been a, a, a boom for Northern Minnesota to producers up here. Uh, also, even with our other crops that, you know, we're always looking for new opportunities. You know, sometimes what's you know, old is new. You know, a couple examples of that is, is rye. Uh, rye, you know, historically has always been grown in northern Minnesota. There have been some development on hybrid rye that makes production more profitable. And, uh, and the, but again, it's a limited market, so it's finding the markets for that rye. Currently, most of our rye goes to uh, uh, ship to Kentucky for bourbon production. And, and there's about 10,000 acres of rye being grown locally in the, in the county for that purpose. And, and it's kind of the same thing with flax. Flax was a crop that historically was always grown in northern Minnesota, kind of faded out in the uh, uh, 1980s with uh, sunflowers and canola moving into the area. Uh, since then, flax has become a desired product for a you know, nutritional supplement for both hu humans and uh, pets because of the omega three, three and six uh, content of it. So uh, we're growing yellow flax specifically for the human and pet food market. So the, you know, some of these things, it's uh, sometimes we know how to produce, but we need help with marketing. Sometimes we need help with uh, how to process it too, in the, in the case of the gra grass seed industry and, you know, setting up business structures to, to, to take care of that. 
Uh, also, you know, some of the more recent things is that's kind of grown out of the grass seed cleaning business. When we, we clean grass seed, we have about 20% uh, of what the farmers haul into the seed cleaning plant is just chaff, chaff and uh, empty seeds and straw, that sort of thing. That's basically just a waste product that, uh, you know, is landfill. There isn't a real specific use for it. So one of the things ARI has been working with us is trying to figure out a, uh, you know, a use for the, that byproduct. And, you know, some of the ideas have been uh, gasification for energy production, uh, pelleting it uh, for potential bedding for the, the uh, poultry industry. And it's just instrumental to have somebody like ARI involved that you can bring, that kind of can bring some idea, ideas to uh, help solve a problem that we have. Um, so it's, re we've really been fortunate to be able to work with ARI and uh, get some of these, businesses up and going and help us with, uh, you know, some of our ongoing uh, issues along the way. And more recently, uh, Kernza is, is one of the products, uh, again, it was developed by the University of Minnesota and the Land Institute out of Kansas. You know, it's the first attempt at a, a perennial grain uh, for hu human consumption. It's a little bit challenged. It's, it, they've taken a uh, grass species and they've been, you know, reading up the seed size and uh, to be more act like a grain, but it's one of those unique things where they're, uh, you know, we don't, don't know how to produce it. Uh, there isn't a known market for it and we don't know how to process it. So it, it's been a learning curve over the past six or eight years. We're getting closer to it, but they're, again, a uh, marketing co-op formed on, for Kernza here in the last year down in uh, central Minnesota and uh, involving kind of growers across all the state. So uh, again, there, there's opportunities, you know, kind of wherever you look in agriculture, uh, sometimes they're, you know, completely new, sometimes they're re redoing some old things and, uh, you know, not all are successful, but, uh, you know, it doesn't take many winners to really have huge benefit for local growers. I think that uh, kind of concludes what I have to say. I'm Perfect. Thanks, Richard. And I think I could uh, maybe fill up the rest of the program just uh, talking to Richard about uh, all of the different uh, things that they have been willing to take on, to think about, uh, to try to move forward. But uh, we're going to bring all our guests back in for a little Q&A. Remember, if you have a question, uh, you can put it in the Q&A portal on your screen, and uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. I'm going to start with uh, one, uh, uh, just a, an eligibility question. So Jen or Shannon, I think we'll, we'll go to you. Who's eligible for assistance through this uh, AIC grant that we've been talking about? An agricultural producer asking uh, or uh, adding value to uh, his or her product that is over 50% of the product to which value is being added must be produced by the agricultural producer. Uh, Jen, who's eligible? Right. So the definition that uh, was dropped in the chat is the guiding uh, definition that we're working with. So essentially, you know, producers who are looking at starting a value added um, operation from their own products that they're growing, um, you know, as long as their their product is 50 percent. Um, or more of what is going into the value added product, it is eligible. There are certainly producers in our state that have, you know, expanded beyond that. They've scaled to the point where they are, um, you know, contracting thousands of acres outside of their own to fulfill the needs of their um, value added processing facility. In that case, they are not eligible for this particular grant. Shannon, anything to add there? I would just uh, just add that if they're not eligible for this grant based on their their scale, um, there are other um, programs right through rural cooperative development where um, right those uh, we could assist under different programs that USDA has. Uh, this one is very specific to right into more individual producers, uh, but other programs exist uh, to assist in those efforts. Does this include aquaculture or fish farming? Uh, I can answer that. So it really depends upon how that um, aquaculture operation is set up. If it is an individual farmer that is producing the product, then anything that they're doing with that product to further process it, bag it, you know, sell it to consumers would be eligible. There are certainly um, aquaculture facilities that are set up as investor-owned entities, and they are not eligible for assistance under this grant. And Colleen, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, or and if you know, but the revolving loan fund that is being set up for the meat processors after year one, I believe aquaculture becomes eligible to apply for those. Is that 
that, that's what I've been told. Um, um, I haven't seen it in writing yet, um, but um, that's what I've been told. Very good. Uh, here's a question. Am I correct that, that these are grants and not loans? Also, uh, what are the timelines? I can also answer that. Sure. So um, this is a grant. Uh, you're correct. It's not a loan. And ultimately, um, the way that we've chosen to um, structure this grant that we received is through you know making more technical assistance available for producers that are doing value-added agriculture. So it's a grant that AURI has applied for. We're, we're utilizing that to deliver services. It is not a, a sub-grant that we will be awarding to um, producers. I think that's important to uh, maybe underline uh, that the AURI will not be making grants to producers to do a, at a uh, value-added projects right and and then i would just add you know that that really you know the main reason for that is um you know the state of minnesota already has a very strong value-added grant program um, which is accessible through the minnesota department of agriculture so we feel our value is really in providing the technical assistance and the producer services that shannon mentioned earlier versus providing um, grants to producers and Richard, I want to come to you for just a second because uh, you touched on it, I think, in a, in a roundabout way, but to producers who are also entrepreneurs or innovators that are uh, watching this webinar, uh, time is certainly an element that you have to be prepared for because a lot of this finding out takes time. Yes, no doubt. I mean, uh, some things come relatively easy, you know, from an idea to, you know, a product and marketing and some will take years and just it's not easy and it kind of do, it depends a little bit on the complexity what's known out there on how long it'll take uh, in the case of Kernza we've been working on that one for almost eight or nine years it clearly isn't uh, you know it's, it's viable but it's not widespread viability crop yet which that's the hope eventually that it can be grown across bigger swaths of the country so it takes time there's no way two ways about it and it's not there until you get the whole value chain built. Yeah, no doubt. That's uh, you need kind of all those legs. You know, know how to produce. You know how to process. You need to have known markets, and continual known markets. Uh, back to the uh, the AIC grant that uh, was awarded to AURI. Again, I think someone who might be thinking uh, that uh, there's going to be some money distributed because the question is how much is available for a project. And uh, really, Jen or Shannon, uh, once the project is set up with the producer, uh, there's technical assistance being made available through the funds that are uh, brought in from the grant to AURI. Is that? That's correct. The funding that, um, you know, I guess I should mention, USDA um, has uh, an active round for Ag Innovation Centers um, where they have $8 million available um, this round. And I believe they've received several dozen applications for Ag Innovation Centers. Um, that will be funding um, distributed to existing Ag Innovation Centers and um, potentially some new Ag Innovation Centers in the country. I might just just add uh, one one more element into that, Dan. In terms of um, you know funding that's available for it, like for AI to work on a project, right? That will be very dependent, um, right? Our, how our system typically works is our business development team will um, right meet with you, um, talk about your project, think about how many hours right are needed to meet some of those objectives and goals that you have, and then uh, we'll put together a work plan and cooperation and think about milestones and. Um, so, you know, the amount of hours available from AURI um, to a project or to an individual producer could vary from, you know, a handful of hours to, right, up to, you know, tens of or hundreds of hours, right, depending on what is needed and, and what that might look like. So um, I think it's a wide range and it's, it just uh, comes through consultation in terms of the, the services that we'll be able to provide, right, in kind or for free to, to help advance some of those ideas. Um, probably a different way of uh, responding to the question. Director Landcammer, uh, early on in Shannon's comments, you mentioned that AURI had been a recipient of an AIC grant years ago, and then it had kind of gone into the shadows for a while and came back with the latest farm bill. Um, is this, can people expect this kind of uh, ebb and flow from USDA? Is this, sometimes grants aren't used as much and they kind of go away or aren't funded? Uh, how does the USDA look at at grants and which ones to keep viable? 
I, I wish I could answer that if, as a ebb and flow. Um, uh, you know, as you know, the Farm Bill is um, written by Congress. And um, so that, that plays into this. Um, all I can say is I'm so excited to see this AIC back because technical assistance is one of the most challenging things, I think, for any producer or any business um, to figure out. USDA Rural Development in Minnesota, we, for all intents and purposes, can't do technical assistance because we decide who gets funded. Um, so for people trying to find technical assistance, this is a great resource. So I'm really excited about it. And I'm hoping it continues on forever, but um, I just can't, I can't answer that one way or the other. Uh, a question for Richard here. It says, uh, what would be the next step for more adoption of ryegrass in Minnesota? Uh, I, I'm assuming they mean for more people to produce it. Do you think there is potential to compete with Kentucky bluegrass? Uh, yeah, that uh, expansion is happening as we speak. One of the limitations actually right now is that uh, the ability to clean just the number of seed cleaning plants that have the expertise doing it is limited. So that's somewhat putting a cap on acres in Minnesota. The longer term uh, thing with happening with ryegrass industry Historically, most of it's been produced in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. In fact, up until 2000, 98% was. Uh, the Willamette Valley is very diverse, has a lot of high value crops, uh, everything from uh, hazelnuts to blueberries to, uh, and basically ryegrass is getting all competed out there. So the, the acres are shipped from Oregon to Minnesota. Uh, again, it's been an orderly growth in Minnesota, but, and it, it probably will continue to happen over the next, you know, 20, 30 years that we'll see more ryegrass coming to both Minnesota and uh, Canada. Does it make sense for uh, producers to be thinking about getting into the grass? That... To a point, but it, again, you know, production's got to match the marketplace. We're, we're currently kind of going to a uh, too much, you know, on the long side of too much production, not enough consumption. So right at the moment, it isn't an ideal time, but I, I think it will come. I think the first limitation to the, the growth is the seed cleaning capacity within the state. Back to uh, one of our participants in the webinar today. Uh, the first round of awards from early applications were announced in January. Can you share how much of the original $500 million is still available to be awarded. Um, I assume that's coming to me and you know I haven't done the numbers. I know that they try to divvy it out at in portions so that it's not one shot gets all. We expect to see another round coming up. I can't tell you when because we haven't been told that yet but um, that's one of the reasons that you know they do a bit, they do another bit and so hopefully um, as soon as we know and that's another good reason to um, go to our website and sign up um, for Gov Delivery because that's where you find out where any program we deliver, when who's eligible and um, when it's open. Our programs have so many different dates. Um, it's, it's challenging. So I encourage all of you to sign up for Gov Delivery at our website. Jen, I'm going to piggyback on that response with one that uh, people who are thinking about possibly having us help them with some technical assistance. Has the, has the grant that we received been spoken for? Have we already selected projects or are we still in the investigative stage? So we've selected the buckets of work that we would like to do, but the specific producers that we would like to assist, they have not been selected. So we um, we anticipate that we'll be serving, um, you know, dozens of producers through this grant. Um, some projects might be, you know, a month, two months, three months in length. Others might, you know, stretch the entire two years of the project, depending what, you know, depending on the scope and scale of the value added processing that they're looking to do. Um, so it, if you're interested, if you have ideas, please reach out and we'd be happy to, to talk through the opportunity. And how, how should they reach out? Is there an application process? 
there it will follow our, our basic um, commercialization services um, application process, which all of our clients follow. So you can reach out through our contact form on our website to get more information about that process. Also, if you are connected to any of the ARI staff members around the state, you can reach out and they'll get, to the right, get you to the right person. And if you want to go looking, it's auri.org to uh, get on our webpage. Uh, here, uh, we operate a small vegetable farm that produces a variety of pickles for sale under a cottage food license. Last, now we're going to get a specific question here, I think. Uh, last year, our sales were about $7,000. We cannot meet current demand, so we would like to help. We would like help scaling up. Are we eligible? We worked with AURI when we got started back in 2014, it says. So. Um, the quick answer is yes, um, you would be an eligible producer, um, and we can talk through what the needs are of your project and, and make sure that they fit within the buckets of producer services, but I think there's probably a fit in there. Uh, we have a liquid microbial fertilizer technology uh, produced in our patented modular system from waste to greenhouse biomass that we have already done over 100 tests that will pull one third of the needed fertilizer from the air and the ground while reducing irrigation needs by about 20%. Who should we chat with at AURI to further help validate this for the world's egg population? It sounds too good to be true, but it is true, they say. So, all right, we got, that's an entrepreneur. They are optimistic and uh, enthusiastic. So uh, we appreciate that comment. Uh, the same same scenario here, Jen, just uh, reach out on the website. Yes, you can reach out to me as well, and I can put you in touch with our team. We've been working on uh, similar products, so I think we could be of assistance in this case. I, I don't think just by how it's described it, it, it would be a fit for this um, this grant, but you know, we certainly have lots of option with, options within our organization. And a question about the, the website at USDA, Colleen, I know you gave it uh, during your presentation. I think Nan also put it in the chat, but uh, they would like it repeated. So would you mind? www.rd.usda.gov and then a backslash MN. So www.rd.usda.gov backslash MN. I, it, and it's really easy to Google right, if you right. want to do that. Google USDA Rural Development Minnesota, and that'll come up. Richard, I want to come back to you and, and talk about uh, the concept of being innovative. Farmers farm uh, for the most part, and they like what they do. How do you and your nephews get your head around that innovative piece on your farms? I think it's an upbringing or mindset. Just um, when something comes along, I, our our inclination is to say yes rather than no. You know, uh, and uh, you've got to, you know, uh, I, remember I served on the wheat grower board uh, for a number of years and going national meetings, you know, and talking to producer in the high plains. And essentially, they grew wheat, and that's, you know, all they uh, knew how to grow. They weren't going to change. and. You know, I think that's, you know, a mentality of growing up with that, you know, if you want to, you know, prosper, you need to change, you know, and that can be changing crops, it can be changing whole, whole, whole lot of things. But again, you've got to be open to change if you if you want to innovate, and is probably the big thing. And, you know, just wanted to tag on a little bit, you know, that's where your eyes get so incremental is when you from the idea, when you first have an idea, that's the hardest point to get to the next step. And ARI has been instrumental in, you know, linking people, you know, the people you need to see, or if it, if it is uh, truly lab work that needs to be done, that they can perform some of that initial stuff. Once you get going, it gets, it gets a little bit easier, but the, those initial ideas are toughest to bring to fruition. And Jen, I think uh, that resonates in your farming operation. You're not only diversified, but you're multifamily. Uh, do you have those internal conversations about what's next and what the next big thing is? Um, almost on a daily basis. And then the next thing that follows very quickly is the risk associated with it. So, um, you know, thanks Richard for your comments about AURI because, um, you know, I, I look at AURI as being um, a tool in the toolbox for producers um, that are evaluating value added. 
op opportunities and we can help de-risk those ideas. So you don't bet the farm <laughs> as you're looking at you know, these opportunities. Shannon, I've got one question for you, and then I think we'll go around the, the table uh, for final comments. But uh, at the state level, we hear a lot about the AIC, which is actually the Ag Innovation Campus in Crookston. And then AURI had an opportunity to apply for the AIC grant, which is the Ag Innovation Centers. And uh, I think we just need to be clear that we're not uh, working in a gray area here. And I know you have firsthand knowledge of both. Yeah, it's a great, great point. It is uh, interesting how um, how things collide, right? Once in a while, they're just uh, the same acronyms get used, uh, and I'm sure Colleen has no idea what that what that's like, right? And uh, um, uh, with USDA, in terms of all the different acronyms that that get used, but no. So AURI is involved in the Egg Innovation Campus, which is the Soy Crush um, facility up in in Crookston, Minnesota, uh, right? In partnership with with Minnesota Soybean, or being led by Minnesota Soybean uh, Growers and Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council. So. Uh, that is its own own program, its own separate um, right entity that's moving forward to look at scale up opportunities for oilseed crops and um, right ways that we can look at innovation uh, there as well. Uh, and then the Egg Innovation Center demonstration grant is the USDA program or the AIC, uh, right? So yes, we have two AIC programs going simultaneously at ARI. So we're trying to keep uh, keep that internalized or right compartmentalized as well. Uh, as we think about those those great opportunities that we're seeing, uh, right, to move value added opportunities forward in Minnesota. So, Dan, that's a good good call out. As people hear about AIC and um, ARI, it's, there's um, there is the the Crush facility up in Crookston, and then there's the the grant program here as well. And since I've got uh, the camera on you, Shannon, uh, final thoughts today as we talk about the AIC grant and how it we hope it's going to help producers uh, come to some value added uh, products and processes. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Dan. Uh, no, it's uh, I appreciate Richard and, and Director Lancome are just taking time to talk about the, the IC program, the importance of value added agriculture. Um, you know, ARI has been at this for, for over 30 years in terms of looking at ideas and how do we de risk some of those initial hurdles, as, as was mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. And I think this program just enhances our ability to do that. Uh, right through um, um, through our regular work that we do, but it really uh, gives us a, a much more um, you know, the resources and the focus on, on working with producers uh, to really uh, explore some of these more in depth, uh, I think, and uh, provide a, a greater a greater level of service uh, on some of those ideas that, that, that we may encounter over the next couple of years. Uh, so I would just, uh, again, encourage, um, uh, right, anyone that knows of somebody that's exploring ideation, uh, thinking about market opportunities, uh, right, please reach out, uh, as Jen mentioned, through our website, or if you know of somebody at, at ARI that you're already working with, uh, and uh, really look forward to, to talking about how we can um, right, take a look at that and, and see how we move that forward. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a great um, synergy with uh, our commodity organizations and research and promotion councils and others that are, are looking at value added opportunities as well. And I think there can be some great overlap and leveraging um, where we can work together on, on moving those forward um, in partnership and collaboration uh, to see if we can shorten that path. Um, and shorten that de-risking period to, um, um, again, add value to the crops that are being produced here. Uh, Richard, uh, uh, any final comments as uh, we wrap up our discussion today? No, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to be on today and uh, just like to thank AURI for their past report and probably future report there. I'm sure we aren't short of ideas across the state of Minnesota. Thanks for your time today. Uh, Director, uh, land camera, anything to add? Um, just, just a quick comment about none of us can do anything by ourselves. So it's all about partnerships. So it's about collaboration. It's about lifting up producers um, with innovation and uh, to thrive and grow and adding value to the crops that they deliver. So um, this is really exciting. And AURI, AURI is a perfect partner to provide this technical assistance. So I'm excited about that. Appreciate those comments and your time today too. And Jen, uh, we'll leave it with you. You get the last word today. Super. Well, I'm going to use it to uh, throw out some definitions. So, if you've been listening to this and wondering, you know, what what exactly is value added agriculture? Um, USDA does have a great definition. Um, it's changing the st the physical state of an agricultural product. Um, you can also um, add value through differentiation of your production or marketing, or even you know product seg segregation. So, just some examples of that: you know, milling wheat into flour, slaughtering livestock or poultry, strawberry 
libraries and to jam marketing organic products, um, identity preserved products, and then you know converting methane from animal waste to generate energy. So those are some examples just to maybe get the gears turning, but uh, we'd welcome any conversations that the producers are, that are out there and listening, um, you know, talk, talk to us about your ideas. We'd be happy to help. That concludes the AURI Connects webinar Wednesday for today. Once again, we want to thank uh, Director Colleen Landkammer, Shannon Schlecht, Richard Magnuson, and Jennifer wagner Lar. AURI Connects webinar Wednesday is presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. And we're also interested in your feedback, so please respond when we send you our event evaluations. And remember, you can get more information on today's program or any of the work that AURI is involved with by going to auri.org. Now, April 12th, the AURI Connects webinar Wednesday will be back, and we'll be looking forward to a program that uh, will recap what we learned during the new uses forum and the bold open reverse pitches. Registration is still open for the 2023 new uses forum that's coming up April 11th and brought to you by AURI and our partners, Compeer Financial and Georgetown University's Rural Opportunities Initiative. You can register and get more information at auri.swoogo, that's S-W-O-O-G-O.com slash NUF 2023, or you can go to auri.org. And you can always learn more about other work that AURI is involved with too by going online at auri.org. And we look forward to having you join us again April 12th for another AURI Connects webinar Wednesday. Mm -hmm.